Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be talking about the cerebral diagnostic test and nursing care for the pediatric patient. Um, one thing I want to bring to your attention before I get started, I made a mistake in my part one video. I made a correction in the description, but for every video that I'm doing for the cerebral, I want to make sure that I also make that correction on video so we are all clear. So. Uh, the mistake I made that I want to correct is the posturing. Now, the two posturing that you have to know is the decorticate and the decibrate. Now, the decibrate, guys, this one is the most dangerous. And the reason for that, the decibrate, when the patient has the decibrate posturing, this is what's known as extension posturing, most likely the midbrain is involved, which means the prognosis is very poor, okay? The corticate posturing that's also known as flexion posturing it the prognosis is not as poor as desperate because uh, uh the midbrain is not involved okay so i wanted to make that correction because the very first video i had them switch all right so the scariest, the worst, the one with the worst prognosis is the desperate, also known as extension prostering, again, because it involves the midbrain. But for, especially for NCLEX, you guys are expected to know the difference between the two. So if you see a picture, you have to know which one's the corticate, you, which one's desperate. You have to know um, what they're also known as, which is a flexion posturing and extension posturing. And you have to know which one involves the, uh, mid, uh, the midbrain, which is the desperate, okay? Now that we got that out of the way, as you guys know, I am trying to be as transparent with you as possible. Today is, okay, I got tested three days ago, so I'm positive flu A, but before I got tested, I've been feeling sick for about two days, so I'm, I'm a good six days in. I'm halfway through, so, <coughs> excuse me. Please forgive me if you see me coughing during the video. I can't help it. All right, guys. Um, also, before we get started, please, as always, do not forget to like this video. Ooh, it's hot. Do not forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, please. That really helps um, the algorithm going and it helps my video show on more people's pages. So if you could please support my channel by liking the video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, that would be very helpful. Okay, guys, so let's get started with special um, diagnostic procedures. I want to go over this table with you. And we're gonna start with the lumbar puncture. Some important things you need to know about the lumbar puncture. It's contraindicated in patients that have increased intracranial pressure. And I explained in part one of the series, the reason for that is if there's increased intracranial pressure and that patient gets a lumbar puncture, that lumbar puncture can cause um, herniation of the brain, okay? So you have to check the ICP before any lumbar puncture is done. And if it's increased, the patient's not gonna get a lumbar puncture. Something else is contraindicated. If the patient has, um, if their skin is infected, they cannot get a lumbar puncture in that area. Think about it, a lumbar puncture, do you really wanna introduce bacteria and pathogens into the spinal cord? into that patient's brain? Absolutely not. So you do have to know about these contraindications for the lumbar puncture. EEG. For the EEG, um, it's important that the patient remain quiet. Now remember, we're dealing with children, so they may likely have to be sedated. And because um, they have to stay quiet, we want decreased stimuli as possible guys because remember what we're looking for is electrical um, potential activity in the brain so we want to um, minimize, minimize external stimuli as much as possible the third test i want to bring to your attention is the mri important things to know about the mri great thing about it it's non-invasive except if contrast media is um, being used but without contrast media and normally it's done without the contrast media it's not invasive but the patient has to stay still and it's loud. And this is a child that we're dealing with. So they may require sedation. Uh, the parent or attendant can remain with the child in the room. This may help keep the child calm. The MRI does not visualize bone detail or um, calcifications. And this is what's most important. I put a star next to it. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you.
no metal can be present in the scanner. So um, no earrings, no jewelry. Um, if that child has a metal implant, pacemaker, no metal. So this is important for you guys to know. Now let's go over special diagnostic procedures, um, EEG, which I covered with you, CT scan, MRI. Let's go down here. Well, the CT scan I didn't cover with you. Let me talk to you about this uh, CT scan very quickly. Where's my highlighter? Okay, with the CT scan, the most important things to know is it requires IV contrast, um, IV access if contrast agent is used. And just like I told you with the MRI, they usually don't use contrast, but they can. With the CT scan, they usually do use contrast. So you expect to have um, IV access and most likely that child will need to be sedated, okay? The importance of lying still for test needs to be stressed. Children unfamiliar with the machines can be shown a picture beforehand. And this has been seen on NCLEX many times. This is re in regards um, to machines such as the MRI machine, okay? The nurse explains the events to a frightened child by comparing them to an astronaut's preparation for space flight. It's important to emphasize to the child that at no time the procedure is painful. Remember, children are very afraid of compromised skin integrity. They're very afraid of anything that is invasive. They're very afraid of bleeding. They're very afraid of their insides coming outside through a hole, through a puncture. So it's very important as much as you can explain to the child in advance um, in very simple terms what, what, what the procedure is. You can give them, them a picture of the machine that they're going to be going into. And of course, you can make it into a type of game to explain to them what they're doing and just help them use their imagination and most often for like the CT scan or the MRI. Excuse me. Physical preparation for the diagnostic test may involve administration of a sedative. And guys, these are children that we're dealing with. They're not going to want to stay still, especially this is a new environment. These are machines that they're unfamiliar with. That MR, M, uh, the MRI machine makes that loud ticking sound. They're going to be afraid. It's very hard to get them to sit still, to lie down still. So most often they're going to have to have a sedative. What did I write on the side here? I wrote, especially if child is young because they won't cooperate. Absolutely. Mm. So nursing care of the unconscious child. Direct emergency measures towards ensuring, ensuring circulation, airway, breathing, uh, stabilizing the spine when indicated, treating shock, and reducing ICPs if present. Let's not skip over that. Make sure you understand what the author, what the text is saying to you. Our um, primary concern is keeping that patient alive, okay? So look what it says. Ensuring, <coughs> excuse me. Ensuring circulation, why? To keep those organs perfused so they don't shut down, right? Airway, because the patient, if they're not breathing, they're dead, right? Airway, breathing. Stabilizing the spine when indicated because we don't wanna cause more harm. We don't wanna cause uh, further damage, cause them to be paralyzed. Treating shock and shock happens when what? There's decreased perfusions, those organs shut down. And of course, reducing ICP if present. Continual observation. Oops. Continual observation of the level of consciousness, pupillary reaction, and vital signs is essential management for CNS disorders. Pay attention when you see that word uh, essential. That's another word for important. So important things that you're constantly going to be doing is checking their le um, level of consciousness. You're going to be checking those pupils for the reaction. You're going to be continuously checking those vital signs. Regular assessment of the neurological status and a vital sign is an integral part of the nursing care of the unconscious child. 
The temperature is measured every two to four hours, depending on the child's condition. The level of consciousness is assessed periodically. Signs of meningeal irritation. They're giving examples. You need to know this, guys. Such as nuchal rigidity needs to be assessed. When you see that word nuchal rigidity, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear that? Meningitis, right? Okay. Also, assessment of level of consciousness also includes response to vocal commands, spontaneous behavior, resistance to care, and response to painful stimuli. I talked about this in part one of the series. Nursing alert. When opioids are used, bowel elimination must be closely monitored because of the potential for the constipating effect. You guys know that opioids slow things down. It can slow down the heart rate, slow down the breathing, bring down the blood pressure, slow down the peristalsis and cause constipation, right? A stool softener should be given regularly with laxatives as needed to prevent constipation. Other measures to relieve discomfort include providing a quiet, dimly lit environment. Why? We want to decrease stimuli. Limiting visitors, preventing any sudden jarring movement. Those sudden jarring movements, guys, that can cause increased intracranial pressure. Okay, so we want to prevent any sudden jarring movement, such as banging the bed, preventing increase in ICP. The latter is most effectively achieved by proper positioning and prevention of straining, such as during coughing, vomiting, defecating. Those three examples they gave us, guys, those increase ICP, and we want to avoid that. Um, something else when here where they're talking about uh, proper um, positioning, remember, we want that patient to be, <coughs> excuse me, we want that patient to be, um, in alignment, right? We want them in a neutral position and we want to avoid hyperextension or hyperflexion of the head. Respiratory management. Adequate airway is always the first priority. Guess what? Nothing else matters if your patient's not breathing. Respiratory obstruction and subsequent compromise leads to cardiac arrest. Always maintain adequate patient airway. Number one, all right, dysfunction of cranial nerves, nine and 10, that's your glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, places a child at risk for aspiration and cardiac arrest. Therefore, position the patient with the head and body to the side to prevent aspiration of secretions and empty the stomach to reduce likelihood of vomiting. Let's not skip over that. So if that patient has a dysfunction of, look at this guys, your cranial nerves, nine and 10, if there's a dysfunction in the cranial nerves, nine and 10, that patient can be at risk for choking of aspirating and going into cardiac arrest. So if there's something wrong with cranial nerve nine and 10, instead of putting them midline, um, and what's the word I'm looking for? In a neutral position, right? Look how we're gonna position them guys. We're gonna position the head, where am I? Position the child with the head and body to the side. Why? We want to prevent aspiration. We want to prevent aspiration, subsequent cardiac arrest. So make sure you guys remember that. Let's move on to intracranial monitoring. <coughs> Excuse me. Intracranial monitoring. What did I write up here? I wrote patient. I have no idea what I wrote. Patient then need this. GCS less than eight, more than eight, but needs respite. I have no idea what I wrote here on the side. Let's keep going, guys. It'll come to me. All right. Direct ventricular pressure measurement remains. Look at this. The gold standard of ICP monitoring. NCLEX expects you to know that. So when you guys are monitoring for increased intracranial pressure, the golden standard for measurement, look at this, guys direct ventricular pressure manage, uh, measurement. That is the gold standard. Let me go back up here because I only write things when it's important. Let me see if I can figure out what I was trying to say. Patients that need this, GCS less than eight, more than eight. Than these. Oh, okay, I know what I was trying to say. All right, so when it comes to increased intracranial pressure, guys, 
if the patient's Glasgow coma scale is uh, less, if it's eight or less, we're absolutely going to be doing the int um, intracranial pressure monitoring. If their Glasgow coma scale is more than eight, um, but they need respiratory assistance or their condition has decreased, we're still going to do intracranial uh, pressure monitoring. So that's what I was saying. Any patient, regardless of their status, if their Glasgow coma scale is eight or less, we're def definitely doing this. If it's higher than eight, but they're, they need some type of respiratory assistant, assistance or their condition has decreased in any way, we're going to do increased intra, I mean, excuse me, we're going to do intracranial pressure monitoring. That's what I was trying to say to you guys. Okay. Patient will be on osmotic, um, osmotic diuretics that help to decrease the increased intracranial pressure. And the, the way that it does this, guys, it decreases the fluid rapidly, which will increase the intracranial, intracranial pressure rapidly. Mannitol. This is given IV. This is the drug most commonly used for rapid reduction of increased intracranial pressure. The infusion is generally given slowly, but may be pushed rapidly if there's herniation or impending herni herniation. Arterial carbon dioxide, your PaCO2, should be maintained at approximately 30 to produce vasoconstriction, which reduces CBF. It's like a domino effect. And by that, guys, it's going to decrease, increase intracranial pressure. Guys, that's all it's going to be for this video. I'm not feeling well at all. I'm going back to bed, but I think this video was only five or 10 minutes. But hey, you guys got five or 10 minutes of teaching. I'm going to go rest. And as soon as I'm feeling better, I'll be right back here. I'm going to try to do two more recordings for you today. If I can do one long one, it'll be a long one. We'll see how it goes. But anyhow, um, if you are currently in the PEDS, um, rotation and you're doing the cerebral um, nervous system, you're doing dysfunction, this is important, guys. Everything that I have highlighted, and especially if I put a star next to it or NCLEX, know it for your test. This is what you're most likely going to see on your exam, okay? Don't say I didn't warn you. I'm sorry this video had to be short, but guys, that's the best I could do. Please um, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Like this video, even though it kind of sucked forgive me, like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And I'm not even going to ask you to share this video because for this video, I'm a hot mess. So please don't share, but still like this video and help the algorithm going by commenting um, in the comment section. Even if you tell me to get better, that's okay. It's going to help the algorithm. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. <coughs> Excuse me. And you guys will catch me on the next video.